Hello and welcome to Jamaica Magazine. I'm your host, Adrian Atkinson. In today's program, we continue our discussion with Dr. Cassin Troop, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Education and Youth. And later, we hear about the musical journey of the reggae artist, Richie Spice. Do stay with us. We have lots in store just for you. Nutritious food. Succulent dishes superior workmanship, and excellent service. Jamaica is on the go. Let's grow what we eat and eat what we grow. Let's harness the indomitable spirit of our most valued resource, our people. Let's support our local businesses. After all, buying Jamaica means building Jamaica. Time and again, we hear that children are the future. If that is true, we need to make sure that their education is one built for moral aptitude and grooming people fit to carry on this race, the human one, that is. Dr. Cassin Troop from the Ministry of Education and Youth continues her conversation on trend, transforming education for national development. Let's listen in. Welcome to Get the Facts, the program that provides you with information on government's policies and initiatives. I'm Theodore Henry. Transforming education for national development, TREND, is a new initiative being implemented by the Ministry of Education and Youth. Its focus is to position Jamaica to become a more globally competitive nation. And joining us for another week to tell us more about this exciting development in the education sector is Dr. Kassan Troop. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Education and Youth. Welcome to the program, Dr. Troop. Thank you for having me again. Yes, sure. yes, again. <laughs> Let's jump into trend. Let's jump right back into trend. Now, we have spoken a bit about it. We spoke about some of the goals of trend. Yeah. Now, I'd really like to hear what has been done so far. Wow. We have been looking at the 365 recommendations, and we sought some technical support. Um, through the help of a consultant to go through the report right. and to help us to develop what we call a transformation implementation plan. Uh, okay. right, to map the recommendations across eight years because clearly we will not be able to do everything right, all at right. once. So we looked at the short term and we are in the short term phase now. We are looking at 145 of the recommendations within the short term. And the short term will see us taking, up, taking about three years. Okay. Then, of course, we have our midterm and our long term that will take up, us up to March 3031. So we have about eight years to get it right. Okay. Right? Um, we have several what we call outputs and inputs, but more so we're looking at the outcomes. So what is it that we want at the end? of the eight years, how will you judge us? Right. How will um, Jamaica judge us to say, did we do this well? And we try to make it simple because we can't tell Jamaica about 365 recommendations and oh. all the seven pillars every day, but we try to make it, make it simple. So one, we have to be able to move our numeracy and literacy rates. Mm -hmm. Right now it's not impressive. I think our literacy rates are about 64.7%. This is across the sector. Right, from coming out of our grade four literacy assessment at okay. this time. We, we were further along prior to COVID, oh. but the COVID effect okay. is upon yes. us. Yes. So we have taken it to about 86 in the past, mm -hmm. and we have declined somewhat. Um, we have to take that up, and we are telling, we are hoping, and we are working hard. We have committed to uh, a rate of no less than 92% by 2031, right? Yes. right? Yes. That's our goal. Tremendous, but I think we owe that to our children, that nobody should leave the sector with, with nothing less than that, you know? And mm -hmm. we're thinking about moving our numeracy from right now it's about 63.4%. We want to move that to a minimum of 78% because it's a harder task. Right, numeracy meaning mathematical, mathematical ability. abilities, you know? Um, we want to, we owe the country that, we owe Jamaicans that. So we have to move our numeracy and literacy rate. We also want to see the readiness of our learners for higher education and the world of work improved. 
Mm. Right. That really speaks in the report, the quality of our education. What's yes. happened to our learners after seven years of high school, after six years of primary schools, after two years? The uh, output. You know, yeah. The, the output. Out, are more so the outcome. So we ah. call it the ultimate outcome. Yes. We want to see all our students, you know, achieving at least five or more um, certification, including math and English and a skill subject. And you will see the TVET coming out right there right, as right. part of the pillar. Um, we are way below that mark now, mm. but we owe it to our, our, our students to get them ready for higher education. We are also contemplating what we call holistic education. So it's not just the academics, mm -hmm. but we still have to get our students rounded. Yes. Civic pride, right? Um, our skills in terms of life skills, decision making, problem solving, conflict resolution. You see the that's videos going on our yeah, own. I know our society is very conscious about what's happening in our schools. Yes. So we look at the spiritual development, the moral development of our learners. That's a big indicator for us. We have to see a flip of, of our society. Are we coexisting? As a country, the crime is very high. Yes, we are relying yes. on the quality of education to change that. Dr. Troop, I, I want to interject here. Eight years, those 300 and odd recommendations, <laughs> right? How much is all this going to cost? Billions. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Billions, especially in the pillar of infrastructure. We didn't yeah. talk about it, but a significant um, sum in, in the estimated cost um, for transformation really is about the infrastructure. Mm. We have to improve the learning environment of our education yes. system. Our schools that are not looking 21st century. People tell us we walk into our primary school and we feel like we walk into the past. Ah. You know, people say, oh, the place looked the same way as when I got there 30 years yes. ago. <laughs> you yes. power scan. We have to um, bring the cutting edge into the classroom. So infrastructure is, is, is a major part of the, the transformation. It's a pillar of its own, yeah. but it's a very expensive pillar because we have to renovate, change out the windows, for example. We have to put the labs right now. Our primary schools don't have labs. We have 767 public primary schools. Mm -hmm. um, and so those, it, that kind of infrastructure is going to take a significant cost. Yeah, right. um, our high schools, the labs have to be retooled and upgraded and the teachers have to be trained. In a couple of years from now, CXC, that is our major um, examining body, will be going e-testing. Ah. So no longer will the students be sitting in a room with paper base. So we have a responsibility to improve the infrastructure in our school so Jamaica will not be left behind. You, you brought us up to the secondary level, but I know one of the pillars is the tertiary yes. sector. Yes. So give us something on that. Yeah, Patti C. is saying, Ministry of Education, the system has to be coordinated. The tertiary sector has to be coordinated. We have to be absolutely certain that the sector is serving the government's strategic priorities. So it's a little like the challenges with the early childhood sector. Yes, or the, there are many programs. Right. Many of them also doing the same programs. Mm. Right, so they're tripping over themselves. They are competing for the same people. But we can look at our niche. Right. Each institution has a strength, right? We have to support that. We also ah. have to look at what the country needs and restructure our sector to respond to the needs of the country so the graduates are actually coming out to serve the development of the country and to advance the transformation of, of the country. Right now, um, that, that needs to be coordinated. We need the higher education policy yes. and the higher education act. Right. We also need to look at the funding structure for higher education. You hear the young people crying out, it's expensive, we can't stay, and it's impacting the retention and the graduation rate at the tertiary sector. So we have right. a lot. You also heard from the report that we need to redirect some of the funding mm -hmm. to the early childhood from the tertiary, but there's an outcry <laughs> against that. So that's something we have to do more consultations about. But we have achieved a lot. So um, right now, the JTC bill is going through joint select. Yes. Right, that will impact the teaching pillar, professionalizing of the, of the teaching profession. Right. That will see us registering our teachers, licensing our teachers like lawyers and nurses. That will see our teachers constantly retooling and upgrading. Professionals. Professionals, yeah. you know. Um, that, and definitely that will rule down to better teaching and quality in the system. Definitely. We have to look at how we attract um, qualified persons into the profession, the best minds into mm -hmm. the profession, yes. so the quality can, right, can yes. be raised. 
um, for infrastructure, we have built out a number of our schools. Oh, hold on, Doc. I have to, I have to <laughs> stop you at infrastructure. This is going to be a big one, and we're going to go to a break right now. Please stay with us. We're talking about trends. Welcome back to Get the Facts. We're continuing our discussion on transforming education for national development trend. Our guest again is Dr. Cassin Troop, Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Education and Youth. Doc, I jumped in when you said infrastructure. It's all yours. Tell us about that pillar. Right, because uh, this year that we're doing the first um, year of the transformation program, we're actually spending approximately $3 billion ah. budgeted for I'm looking at infrastructure and technology. Wait, sorry, budgeted for. We're not looking for the money, we have it. Budgeted for. Love so that. For, for infrastructure alone, I think it is $1.1 billion that we got from the, the, the Ministry of Finance nice. to carry out the infrastructure work in our schools, to expand, to build out the auditorium, the classroom, to do electrical work, to build um, labs and so forth. Yes. And, some, and we have these on programs. We have commitments to some schools because mm -hmm. we can't do everything at the same at time. Right, so we build right. out programs that we're looking at a an assessment center for special education needs over the east because uh -huh. we don't have one there so those students are not properly served so mm -hmm. that's part of it to make sure that our students can be assessed and can be um, channeled into the right direction for services appropriate services we are looking at our broadband internet broadband program a massive program that we are rolling out if you're going towards e testing <laughs> exactly if you're going right. towards e testing you have to have a trusted infrastructure in right. place right. and i can tell you that this time we have over i think 663 of our schools already on the broadband yes yeah. getting internet support being fully funded by the ministry of education so they can right. disconnect their private providers and save that money to do something else we right. didn't take that funding from them you can you know redirect that into an, an area of need um we are building out the labs as i told you in the e-learning so this year with the budget we put we got about fifteen thousand laptops mm -hmm centered on the high school that's over two million u.s dollars invested right there into the high schools again getting ready for e-testing yes, and yes. getting our students in the 21st century and of course you know we gave out a lot of devices to support added to that we are completing the laptop provision for teachers so yes jamaica has a laptop right, for every right. teacher yes and though it came through advocacy through the union so we supported it at the Ministry of Education and we agreed over a three year to make sure that every teacher that comes into the system is yes. resourced in this way to support the teaching and learning process. We're on the final leg yes. of that and I can say about 85% of our teachers have a laptop in hand oh, that's and great. we are completing that. So that's some of the major things that we have done under infrastructure. Um, we're partnering with Digicel Foundation and other international private providers to, to build out some labs and resource rooms in our schools, to build out special education centers in our schools. Um, under the pillar of governance and, and accountability, IDB is currently working with us to build out the software mm -hmm. and, and support to enable accounting for financial resources in our schools. At the school level? At the school level. Okay. So right now, for example, our principals at the primary level, they have to do a lot of the accounting work. Mm. And so they have said to us, under transformation, can this be taken away? We want to focus on teaching and learning. And it is the right thing that. to do. In the yeah. high schools, they have bursars mm -hmm. who are dealing with the finances. Right, right. So why can't we? And we are, we are held to the same standard of performance. Yeah. So we are working with IDB now to train um, 
our, our, our teachers and, and principals and supporting the schools. We are going to be putting in the software to enable the work. We are layering the technology onto the system. We are rolling out our EMIS, our Education Management Information System, yes. which is a part of the accountability and governance arm and also the data-driven approach to education. Now we're going to be tracking attendance tracking behavior, those are the three modules and performance that we're rolling out. Digitally. Digitally. Yeah. Dr. Troop, when I asked you how much this is going to cost, you said billions, without <laughs> yes. missing a beat. And I want to touch on that for our final pillar, finance. What is expected to happen here? Well, there's a, there's a um, within the sector, um, the, there's a view, and it's an honest view, that we need more, more resources to resource the sector we need to look at um, the early childhood, as I said to you before. We yes. have to move that percentage support that we are pushing into that sector. There's, there's a call for the operations of the school. The principals will tell you that our grants have been fixed for a long time right. and inflation has eroded the value of that. So operationally, we need more. So what we have done thus far, we have developed the terms of reference to create the the, the group of persons who will examine the different levels. So we have a, a group of, 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 of volunteers who will look at the cost of education at the infant, primary, secondary, tertiary levels. So different groups are working today, examining the inputs and outputs and see what is truly needed. Yeah. And then we're going to look at how we're going to do that. So the tertiary sector, for example, they are looking at some factors that should be considered in how we fund them. For example, the teachers' colleges are saying, you need to give us resources for maintenance. Mm -hmm. You need to look at a variable for research, because how are you going to grow right, and right. be on the cutting edge if we're not doing constant research? You need to look at academic support, student support. So they have come up with some variables because we have started the consultation already. We need to look at the, the, the infrastructure within the colleges as well. The report pointed out that we build these institutions for years, but the maintenance of the institutions, yes. so financing that, financing the programs, you know, do we share? Do we have parents get involved? Is it uh, a fully funded um, arrangement? Do we look at what the country needs mm -hmm. and prioritize those Make programs? Decisions on that, right. Right, and, and then other programs. Can. So it's a robust conversation that we have had to have. Um, we have to have over the, the period. We want to have it within the first um, three years because... Which we are now are within. Yes. Yeah. So we are, in a, we are coming to close the first year, and these are the structural things we are doing so we can start having the, 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 the personal conversation because those are going to be honest, brutal, yeah. and it means that we have to move with alacrity in response to, to what comes to the, to the table in a realistic way too because yes. we can't fail our country. We can't take everything here and then it, it at a cost of something Understood. else. We have to understand the implications of the bigger picture. But like for now, I can tell you that we are spending uh, $163 billion in the first year. Oh Billions. My. Yes, yes. Right? We started out at the, at the approval of $144 billion and with the compensation review, we had to get about 20 um, billion more to compensate our, our educators. So, so it's a lot. So when I say it's a lot, you understand lot. that yeah. this is just one year. And I believe by the time we start to work out the true cost and the operational needs, you should see that increasing over time. So Dr. Troop, we're, we're at the end of the interview and I want to take us right back to the beginning. Just give us uh, our audience, give us that, give us the vision one more time, trend. Trend, the ultimate outcome numeracy and literacy. We want to see a massive improvement in those areas. You will not be satisfied with anything less than at least 90% for our literacy rate. We have 92 in mind. Um, we have to communicate that formally to the system. The, liter the numeracy rate has to move up, right? We're at 63.4 now. We want to take that to about 78% minimum. We want to make sure that all our learners who enter the formal system, that all our, our students, our babies, infants born into this country, they are into the education system. And once they are in, we want to see them completing their education system. So those dropouts, we have to pay attention to them. Where are our students when they are not in school? So the completion rate is a matter of importance to us. We want to see the readiness 
for higher education and the world of work. So what is it that you get at the end of your seven years of education? That's important to us. We want to look at the holistic development of our learners, those what we call the soft skills, how oh, patriotic we are when we exit the system, yeah. our civic pride, our care for the environment, our financial literacy, all of those things are very important to the rounded development of the learner exiting the system. So those are some key, what we call ultimate outcomes. After all the building of the STEM schools, after putting in the technology and the labs, after putting in the, the legislation, you know, after putting in the governance framework, those are the inputs. Right, but the ultimate outcome, the success indicators that you will judge us by, really about the student, the learners. Can they read? Can they write? Can they move on to tertiary? Can they transition into the world of work? Are they completing their education? Are they rounded enough? And can they contribute to national development yeah. and transforming their own social and economic realities? That's it, what it is, transforming education for national development. Yes, it's, a, it's an outcome and a long-term plan to trend education upwards in Jamaica. This has been Get the Facts. Our guest was Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Education and Youth, Dr. Catherine Troop. Thank you for watching. And until next time, I'm Theodore Henry. Take good care. We continue our reggae donkey series, Hit Me With Music, with the invigorating singer Richie Spice. He tells a story of emerging from the shadows of stars to becoming a beacon of light himself. I see myself as the voice of the people without voice. Change your ways now, young juvenile, change your ways. Whoa, you better be today, go change your ways. Some type of liberty, it not going to win. No time now. Richie Spice errols himself as a catalyst for change for the voiceless. But first, he had to find his own voice. One of 11 children, that was not always easy to do. So, he did what most younger children do, follow in the pathways fashioned by their older siblings. Born in the community of Rockall, St. Andrew, the singer is the younger brother to Pliers of the duo Shacademus and Pliers. I know this little girl, her name is Maxi. Her beauty is like a bunch of roses. As well as the chill singer, Spanner Banner. If there's trouble at home, then you can't take a pain, boy. Baby, come chill with me. And I sit and watch them play the music over the years. You know, and it, uh, it has inspired I, you know, and then, um, it becomes a part of me. Richie remembers the trials he endured as an aspiring musician. We went to studio, we went with me, and um, we went to record, and you know, producer send you back, you're frustrated, you sleep overnight at studio. There were a lot of ups and downs, but... One day, my brother, Spanner Banner, brought me to um, Tough Gang studio, and I met this gentleman by the name of Clive Hunt. He was working there with a Next virgin by the name of Computer Paul, playing a rhythm, but I was just there at the time, but um, I wasn't the one who was supposed to. The time wasn't for me, it was for our next artist, but the next artist never showed up at the time. His brother told him to go into the studio booth and sing. That was when he belted out a song called Grooving My Girl. My girl now was a song really, which mean, you know, whenever time I used to go to studio, you know, I didn't have to say, oh, my brother is players and bigger brother is Panavan. I go with my girl is a song that give me a run, really, which mean I could say, go to a producer and say, I did this song, you know, and say, oh, yeah. And while Jamaica was grooving, the international reggae scene was waiting. Watch those places you walk and mind the way you done. Watch out for the vampires who will sneak up in the dark. Watch out for the big time thief who claims say that them smart. But I bring in the crack and the gun for come mess up the youths them mad. Earth Around Red is a song when it's mean, you know, catapult I and a more international 
vibration, you know, while linking up with fifth element and Tyrion, you know, get a little management behind and a little strength. You know, it, it catapults a little far in the, in the music industry. Yeah? They say that imitation is a form of flattery, and Richie is an example in this regard. Everybody starts from somewhere. You know, if you check the artists, the most artists pattern somebody before them find them true inner self. Yeah, when them find them true inner self now, then you find that them come out and express themselves, express them true self. Incidentally, the younger brother is enjoying more musical success than his brothers in whose footsteps he followed. Love is a gamble, but it's a game I wanna play. Counts that his other influences grew from the interest of another brother who worked at a radio station back in the day. He normally bring home the, he used to have a turntable. Uh, Sunday morning, he had normally play the songs like the LP, the man, the 45 and the, You know, normally play people like uh, Bob Marley, Burning Spear, the Gregory Isaac, you talk about CC, Coco T, but Beres for the man, those type of people. So we grow under the influence of those. Music, those music grows up as a little child, as a child coming up, yeah? And we keep it up until today. <laughs> Once upon a time, where the kids need to play, they used to go to the park. Mama always says, I'm going to take up a book. Now they say, take up your tablet. Reggae music often serves as a voice for the oppressed and a catalyst for change. This symbolic gesture can be found in the brown skin artist's work. We, we, we write and put out there, you know, that the younger generation go and listen still, you know, and um, we'll keep it that way and keep it on a, 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 a moderate vibration, really, which means, you know, acceptable to the world. And how does he feel about the non-Jamaicans partaking in the music? Artists come here from Europe and you see a gentleman might rise and say, Yes, why do the music gone? The music not that Jamaica again. It's done with it, done now. The music cannot leave Jamaica because Jamaica is the grassroot, grassroot of reggae music as the tree, the birth. So it was birth here, man. So it cannot leave. And we're glad when the people then come and take a little piece of it and share it and go spread it bigger. Richie admits he's been all over the globe and has seen how significant the musical reach of reggae is. People who speak English, people who don't speak our language, Latin, whatever they speak, you know, I mean, people still overstand, people sing with you word to word, you know, and um, show that they appreciate of, they appreciate of the music and the appreciation of the whole vibration of the beat. Eh? So, what's next for Richie Spice? The journey continues. Of course it does. The artist released his latest album in 2023 and is enjoying the success of his 14-track label. Internet boys, internet girls, living in a digital world. Internet boys, internet girls, them call it the modern world. And this is where we end today's show. To catch a repeat of this or any other, feel free to log on to our website, jis.gov.jm. Until next time, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Do take care. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica. Jamaica.